Thank you for joining us on Coffee Break, brought to you by the Middle Alabama Area Agency on Aging, or M4A. M4A is a part of a network of 13 area agencies on aging that cover all 67 counties across the state. We are located in Alabaster, and we cover Blunt, Chilton, Shelby, St. Clair, and Walker counties. We would love to find out how we can help your family today. For previous episodes of Coffee Break, feel free to check out our YouTube channel. Welcome, everybody, to Coffee Break number 29. This is November of 2022, and as part of this Coffee Break, we are excited to be celebrating National Family Caregivers Month and Alzheimer's Disease Awareness Month with our guest speaker, Dr. Rita Jablonski. Coffee Break is brought to you by the Alabama CARES program. Alabama CARES is a statewide program to provide support for caregivers. We're welcoming today Dr. Rita Jablonski, who is an author, professor of nursing, as well as the owner of Dementia Centric Solutions, LLC. And Rita, I am going to let you brag on yourself and share which accolades you find most important. And I'm also going to stop sharing my screen so you can get us all started. Thank you so much. And it's telling me, yes. I think the accolade I am most proud of is nurse and nurse practitioner. Um, the PhD is fun, but I really enjoy my clinical practice. And it's my clinical practice that really helps influence my research. And then the cool research stuff I do, I do improves my clinical practice. Anyway, that's uh, thank you for that really warm introduction. I really uh, appreciate that. And as Crystal mentioned, I do have a blog, I have a Facebook page, and I have a podcast. And all of these are, are free resources to help individuals learn more about dementia behaviors. In fact, my last episode that I dropped Monday morning was about frontotemporal, behavioral variant, frontotemporal dementia, which is a dementia that is not really well understood by the general population. You say dementia and everyone pictures the uh, 75 year old uh, mom or, or grandmom who is uh, holding a baby doll and is rather placid. They don't look, they don't expect to see someone in their 50s or early 60s who doesn't uh, have that stereotypical Alzheimer's type approach. So anyway, free resources there. And if you are watching this on the replay, in the comments, hit hashtag replay, because we like to keep track of who is watching this and how much outreach we're getting. And I'm going to go into this presentation. Whenever I ask people to think about being a family member and a caregiver for someone living with dementia, and you're making plans, I ask people to consider, is this plan for them or is it for you? I often hear families say things like, this may be his last Christmas or her last Hanukkah, and we want the kids to know mom, mom or grandpa before he or she gets worse. And sometimes that puts a lot of pressure on everyone. And right now we have to think of flu, COVID-9. And when I was watching the news the other day, they're talking about a triple denic, which would be the intersection of COVID-19, flu, and RSV, which is a respiratory virus. And all of those health concerns have to be taken into account when you're planning your holiday activities. And the best of intentions may turn travel and the holidays into a massive nightmare. 
it's important to accommodate the person with dementia, not they accommodate to us because we are flexible. We can change up our schedules and our reactions to things. People living with dementia have less ability to adjust to changes and they may be overwhelmed. And I'll go into some of the brain changes that influence this behavior. But one of the uh, anecdotes I want to share is several years ago, I had a lovely couple who were seeing me in the, in the clinic and the wife really wanted to take her husband and make memories before he got worse. And he was already out of place. He was in the moderate stages of dementia and he was already very overwhelmed in new environments. He became very irritable when his schedule was altered. And they had several adult children living out of state and she wanted to fly to, I forget what state they were in, like Nevada. She wanted to fly to Nevada and they were going to spend a couple of weeks in Nevada over the holidays and they were going to stay with each adult child for a number of days. And my first thought was, oh heavens, because all of that travel is going to trigger a lot of anxiety and wandering behavior. And he was already having some behavioral problems. And I tried to dissuade her from that. I kept saying, this isn't going to go well. This is not going to serve him well. Oh, but the children want to see him. Great, the children can fly into Birmingham. Well, we're gonna go out and see them. Okay, within day three, I was getting stat paged because he was just, his behavior was just off the rails. First of all, we had the uh, difference in time. So his schedule was off. And the frequent moving and being in an unfamiliar environment with people he had not seen in years, and some of the grandchildren he had not seen in a while, so he didn't know who they were. And it culminated in him getting up one night and trying to find the bathroom and winding up in the kitchen stark naked and unfortunately using the trash can to relieve himself because he couldn't figure out where the bathroom was. And his commotion woke up the whole family and that is not the way you want to remember your father or your grandfather so when i got the the emergency page she said to me i hate to say it i mean i wasn't going to say i told you so because that's tacky and it doesn't help anything but she said to me can you prescribe a medicine or something we we can't do this and they wound up cutting their travel short and I think all the time of that experience and how if, if I, I wish I had been firmer and I, I would have talked more about accommodating him, not making him accommodate us. But that situation has, that will be with me throughout my career. Okay. So the goal of today's talk is to provide supportive and realistic ways for families to enjoy this upcoming holiday season by avoiding common sources of caregiver conflict and stress. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about dementia and some of the changes in the brain that cause the behaviors. And dementia is an umbrella term like car. And just like we have different makes and models of car, we have different types and subtypes of dementia. The most common ones are Lewy body, Alzheimer's, frontotemporal, and vascular. Alzheimer's is the first, vascular is a close second, Lewy body is third, but if you go to the Lewy body association, they say it's the second most common. And then the frontotemporal dementia, which affects about two to 10% of all dementia cases, but I'm wondering if it's just not well diagnosed because a lot of neurologists aren't sure what they're looking at because people with frontotemporal present with behavior changes first, then memory problems. So this slide shows a picture of two brains. The brain on the right is a healthy brain. The brain on the left was harvested from a person who died from Alzheimer's. And all the dementias at the end cause brain changes that look very much like the brain on the left. You see the, those uh, fat parts are called 
gyruses or gyri, and the spaces in between those fat parts are called sulcus for one, sulci plural. And in the brain on the left, you see there's been so much nerve damage that the gyri have shriveled. And the sulci, the spaces between, uh, between neurons, have really gotten bigger. And this is going to make sense in a second. People living with dementia often have problems with short-term memory. It depends, the short-term memory shows up depending on the type of dementia. But when it happens, it usually follows this pathway. People lose, the memories they have last are lost first. Another way to think about this is a box of, like a, of the healthy brain is like a box. All of your memories are placed in the box. Your earliest memories are tucked away at the bottom. Your most recent memories are right on the top. Imagine your brain as a large box filled with all of your memories and then that brain, that box shrinks. It slowly starts to shrink. It's slowly becoming smaller. When that happens, just like in this image, the toys at the top all fell out and the toys that were closer to the bottom are more accessible, that's what happens in the brain of people living with dementia. As the neurons shrink, the most recent memories are lost and the memories from long ago are more accessible. That is why a person with dementia may completely forget that he or she had lunch or they will, well, I had lunch, but I'm not sure what, what I had for lunch, but they can tell you about Christmas, you know, 20 years ago and who was there and everything else. I often have family members say, but his memory is great. He, he talks about stuff from long ago that we all forgot. Not exactly. People with dementia move backward, backwards in time. The memories from 40 plus years ago are now so vivid, they often feel like they are reliving the memories, not just recalling the memories. So the loss of your current memories plus access to older memories literally creates a new reality. This is why the person living with dementia will say the same topic or ask the same question repetitively. This is why they may refuse care. You are trying to get them to take a bath. They're telling you, I just had a bath because they have a memory of having, of having taken a bath and that memory feels like it just happened. The loss of short-term memory also messes with the perception of time. I have a sense of how much time is passing because I have intact short-term memory. And all of us have had the experience of doing something enjoyable and we feel like five minutes has, have gone by and we look at our watch or our cell phone and actually an hour and a half have gone by. We also have the experience of being in a meeting and swearing we've been in this meeting for an hour and a half and we check our watch and this meeting has only been going on for 10 minutes. So there's, we all have that perception of time that is influenced by our enjoyment or lack of enjoyment of the activity. But in people with dementia, the loss of short-term memories really messes with the perception of time, which is why caregivers may have the experience of going to visit their family member every day in a facility or going to the person's house every day to see them. And every day they are told by the person living with dementia, no one comes to see me, I'm here by myself. And if you say to them, well, I was here yesterday, no, you weren't. So a lot of people ask me how to handle that. And I suggest trying out different approaches, sometimes, People have guest books where every time they come, they sign in the guest book or visitors sign in the guest book. And you can say to the, the person, I'm really sorry you don't remember this, but I came yesterday and I signed your book and so-and-so was here. And I know you may not remember, but you, you are loved and we want to come here. And the thing is, a person may forget the visit, but the emotional positivity, the happy vibes, they persist long after the event. Because I've had people say to me, well, my mom doesn't know, know who I am and I don't think she remembers that I came to visit. What, should I even go? 
Absolutely, because it's a positive emotion that will persist after the visit, after the memories. This is also a reason why people literally move backwards in time. So, um, okay. Another important component is your emotions. If you are stressed out, you can, without realizing it, you can trigger behaviors. As dementia progresses, people living with dementia are less adept at listening to your words or are comprehending your words, and they become more focused on nonverbal behaviors as well as facial expressions and people's energy. Having worked as a nurse for decades, I can remember early in my career, I dreaded if a, a person in the hospital, if a patient had a cardiac arrest and we had to call a code because I had some experiences at the beginning of my career where the person running the code was very freaked out, very unsure of himself and his nervousness per permeated the rest of the group. It was horrible. People were dropping things, yelling at each other. It was just a bad scene. Then later in my career, I worked on a surgical unit where the uh, code team had a more mature group of people and these people were calm. You'd call a code. I mean, they, they weren't slow. They were getting there pretty fast and they're very efficient, but there was a quiet energy and nobody raised their voice. It was very even. And I remember actually almost enjoying the code. I know that sounds horrible, but it we ran like clockwork because everybody involved and the leader running the code, she was very calm, very chill, and things got done. So if you're having a horrible day, if you're stressed out, your feelings can be contagious. And I used to use tuning forks in the clinic, except I started making a mess. But if you take a tuning fork and you strike it and you watch and listen for a few minutes, you will no longer hear the sound and you will no longer see the vibration. But if you put that tuning fork into a glass of water, the water will go all over the place because even though you can't see or hear the vibrations, the vibrating movement, it's still vibrating. So I use that as an example of how our energy can be transmitted from one person to another. I mean, let's face it, there are people who walk into a room and that room just lights up and there's people who leave the room and the room lights up. The take home message here with these brain changes is avoid quizzing. Avoid saying things like, remember I told you, logic, does not work. Well, dad, you have to take a bath. It makes sense that you take a bath. No, that, that you're just going to get onto the hamster wheel of arguments. Arguing does not work. Your explanations, your, inter, your verbal interactions should be short, sweet, concrete. I'll talk about that in a second. And you need to make sure your energy is calm, like fix your vibes. And you may be thinking as a caregiver, okay, you want me to be calm. I'm, I'm so stressed out. I'm so tired. I, I, I can't do this. Unfortunately, yeah, it, it's so important to watch your own energy because if you're anxious and upset or frustrated, that may trigger more behavior. But don't fear, I'm going to give you strategies for handling some behaviors. Now, another way to think of the brain is the brain has all these neural networks that connect one part of the brain to another. And that's how we speak, that's how we do things, that's how we retrieve memories. So in a healthy brain, let's say when you first woke up, your neural impulses were like these vehicles going up and down a highway. One neuron fires and then that energy goes to another neuron which fires and that charge and those neurotransmitters get passed along a whole road, a whole highway of connected neurons. And it's those firing networks that allow you to retrieve memories and to go about your daily life. By this time in the afternoon, most of our brains look and feel like this. We have so much going on that if my 
supervisor were to come into my office and ask me a question as I'm giving this talk, hopefully nobody does because that would be rude. But if, if she or he were to walk in and ask for something, I am so engrossed in this topic, all my neurons are all about this topic that it'll take me a couple seconds to stop and readjust and figure out what they're asking from me. A person living with dementia, a lot of these highways, these neural networks are wiped out depending on the severity. And just like many of you this morning were trying to get to work and maybe some of the highways or the larger roads you were traveling had storm debris. So you had to take an alternate route. I drive every morning, lucky me, on 65. If all the lanes are open and there's no accidents and there's no truck that's on its side, a lot of traffic moves back and forth and I can get to work fairly rapidly. If there is any type of accident or problem on 65, my, my backup is to hop off and take 31. Well, everybody else has the same idea. So when we go onto this smaller road, you have all this traffic on this little tiny road and it gets easily overwhelmed and traffic stops. That's similar to what goes on in a person living with dementia as the dementia progresses because the body loves redundancy. You don't have one network, you have multiple neural networks, just like you have main highways and secondary highways. So if certain neural networks are compromised in a person's brain who has dementia, it, that's why it takes sometimes longer for people with dementia to respond to a question. You may ask them something and get the response five minutes later because their processing speed is slower thanks to the changes in the available neural networks that are involved in retrieving that information. It's important over the holidays to maintain consistent or same routines. We teach little children schedules and routines to create memories of how to do things and when to do things. In people with dementia, routines support the memory. Routines, consistent routines, relieve anxiety. And if you relieve anxiety, you may also reduce anxiety-induced wandering. Consistent schedules and routines avoid things like missed medications. Because if you get your loved one up every day at 7.30 and by eight o'clock, you are giving them their medicine, and then you decide, you know, you're both tired, we're gonna sleep in, and you both get up at say 9.30, you may be out of your routine and it's possible to miss medications or take medications at different times. And so they may not be as effective. Consistent routines also prevent urinary and fecal accidents because sometimes if you know your loved ones bowel and bladder schedule, you often get them to the bathroom before they void. Or you may be so in tune to their body language that if you see them getting fidgety or you know taking off their clothes, you realize it's time to take them to the bathroom. But if you have deviated from your schedule or you're distracted doing other things, you may miss those cues and now you have an accident. So what does all this mean? It means that it's often a good idea to adapt holiday traditions. So I know in, in my family, it was a big deal for everybody to go to midnight mass. Midnight mass was a spectacle. And I mean that in a positive way. You had to get there by 11 o'clock or you didn't get a seat. And you would listen to the choir sing Christmas carols. Mass would begin around midnight. There was the creche with the family and the three wise men and the sheep and all that stuff. And it was really a beautiful service because the church was decorated with Christmas trees and candles and all sorts of cool stuff. But midnight mass was a marathon event. You, you had to get there by 11 o'clock and you didn't walk out of that church until possibly after one o'clock in the morning or even later. And 
that may be something that your family has done for years or whatever service you go to. If you have a person living with dementia, it's probably a better idea to go to less crowded services and earlier services. If you want to watch live streaming events, you may want to do one some that are uh, faster or, or shorter. There's also the tendency for all the family to show up and all wanting to gather together in one place. While that logistically works, your family member living with dementia may be overwhelmed. Short, frequent visits are preferable to these giant mega gatherings. And it's a good idea to update the out of town family members because I, I see this all the time and I think, what is wrong with people? But people think they're being helpful and the out of town family members may start playing the guess who I am game. And that drives me crazy. So no quizzing. When you introduce yourself to a person living with dementia, don't assume they know who you are. So if I was going to walk up to my Nana, I would say, hi, Nana, I'm Rita, I'm Bud's oldest. That's the context, because my father's name, nickname was Bud. And either she says, well, hello, Rita, and looks confused, or she says, of course I know who you are, Rita, and laughs. Now, sometimes people living with dementia, as their frontal lobe starts to go a little offline, they may blurt something out like, wow, you've put on a lot of weight since the last time I've seen you. They're not being rude. You, you all know that we'll, we'll see different family members and you're thinking it. You're thinking, I wonder if she had work done. I wonder if he is still living life hard because he looks like he was rode hard and put away wet. I mean, as we see family members, we, we note who looks really good and who looks a little rough, but we don't verbalize it, but we are thinking it. The thing with people living with dementia, because they have uh, fewer neurons, they may not have strong brakes to prevent their thoughts from going out their mouths. They're not trying to be rude. It's, it's neurodegeneration. Like the shrinking box slide, the older memories are often intact. This could be a good time to organize photographs, digitally record family history, and even capture recipes. I had a colleague who went to Brazil and her mother was showing signs of dementia and they were worried about losing all her recipes because she never wrote them down. She, and if you asked her, she would just say, well, I, I just make it. So I gave her the suggestion of bringing in other family members where one person can work alongside of her mother who was making the Christmas bread or the other you know, family recipes. Someone else could be recording it using their smartphone camera. And a third person could even be writing down the ingredients and trying to figure out Sometimes people use measuring cups. Sometimes they say, oh, it's just a pinch of this and you just put enough in until it tastes right. So there, there are ways to capture recipes. This is also an opportunity to explain to younger family members why the person with dementia may mistake them for others. Because you can look at some of these old photographs and I have a slide in a minute that illustrates how many people in a family may resemble each other. And that's where the confusion happens. There's also something that the brain does and it, the brain likes to make sense out of abstract shapes. So this is a piece of floor tile. And if you look at it, you may notice there's like a, a face in it and the, the side of a duck. You might be seeing other things in those abstract patterns. Where I'm going with this, uh, if you haven't put up your holiday decorations, it's okay, less is more. So, first of all, you have safety issues. If you have all of these decorations and lights and stuff all over the house, you have wires, you have obstacles. And all of these patterns that are out there can increase confusion and cause illusions. What I showed you on the previous slide that's an illusion. An illusion is seeing, is misperceiving what you are seeing or seeing things that 
really weren't put there on purpose, but your brain is trying to make sense out of it. It's also a reason to conserve your energy. I am terrible. My Christmas decorations consist of a couple, you know, Christmas trees on a dining room table, and I call it a day. In my case, I have three fur babies who, two are cats, and the youngest is a 11 month old kitten, and her name is Lady Gray, and she sees every decoration as a challenge, as in how long before I can destroy it. The thing to also know is that outlets, even though the outlets for people to demonstrate purpose, to be needed, to be important, even though those, those um, needs remain stable, the outlets for the person to feel important shrinks. So what that means is the person living with dementia usually wants to be included with the holiday plans and the inclusion needs to be tailored to that person's abilities. You should allow them to help with the holiday plans and it's better to do one to two things a day over the course of days or weeks instead of deciding, hey, it's the day after Thanksgiving, let's decorate the whole house. Participating in holiday traditions also provides opportunities to reminisce, to talk about the old days, and to tap into those old memories. When you're interacting with a person living with dementia, you want short, respectful requests and express gratitude. Thank you for helping me. And when I say short, respectful requests, the length of your sentences and the complexity of your sentences has to match where they are. So someone who just received a dementia diagnosis and who, who seems to be doing pretty well, you likely can have a, a conversation as we are having right now. In the moderate stage where people are starting to have trouble with banking and, and doing stuff around the house, you want to give them, you want to interact with them with very direct sentences. So instead of saying, before feeding the dog, take her outside, I would say to someone, take the Amira outside, then feed her. As the dementia progresses, I would only offer one sentence at a time. Because in the clinic, we often say, before pointing to the door, point, point to the ceiling, and most of the people point to the ceiling and don't do the second half because they couldn't hold on to that memory. Now, I told you about family resemblance. This is a picture of me second to the left and my godchild Lauren, and that's my mom on the right and my sister Margaret over to the far right. Margaret is Lauren's mom. I am Lauren's aunt. However, if you look at this picture from 1970, that's me. And that little four or five-year-old looks a lot like Lauren. So those are examples of how people can be misidentified. And so looking at old family scrapbooks is really helpful because you can take a picture of say, great uncle Bob and show your child, look, you two could be twins. Now, this happens every holiday. You're the one caring for the person living with dementia, but people come from out of town or you have family members who aren't as involved as you and they think they're being helpful and they are criticizing you, but they're couching it in the form of advice and concern. So here's your script. Thanks for asking, and then give them something to do. Hey, I just read something on the internet about this new cure for Alzheimer's. Have you talked to dad's neurologist about that? And you're thinking, oh my gosh, I think if there was a cure, if jelly beans cured Alzheimer's, I think we would have known this by now. So what you do is you say, thanks for asking. Can you bring us some desserts? Or if the family member is really ticking you off, 
you say, thanks for asking. Can you sit with mom while I go to the bathroom? And then you go to the bathroom and then you disappear for 30 minutes and let your out of town family member have the pleasure of caring for the person living with dementia for a little bit. I mean, it's respite, but we, I had a situation where I had, I had uh, two sisters and one sister was the primary caregiver. The other sister was very critical. And sister number one, who was the primary caregiver, she and her husband were celebrating their 20th anniversary and they wanted to go out of town for the weekend. And so they asked sister number two to come. Well, sister number two did not want to come to mom's house. She wanted mom to be brought to her house. And right there, I thought, oh, this is going to be fun because I knew mom would be confused in this environment. Well, sister number one went out of town and turned off her cell phone. Sunday afternoon on the way back, she turned on her cell phone and no joke, there was like 30 missed phone calls and all these messages. And after that situation, sister number two never offered criticism again. That was kind of a, a I, I think a heavy handed way to handle the situation, but it was highly effective. It's really important to engage in compassionate dementia communication. People living with dementia forget that they forget, which is why you avoid remember. Presenting logic or arguing is pointless. So if you say to your family member, okay, we're getting ready to go to X event, and your family member with dementia says, you never told me, and you're thinking, yeah, I did, and there's all these post-it notes, and there's a calendar, and it's circled, we, showing them all of that isn't going to accomplish anything. You simply say, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you we were going to this uh, Kwanzaa party. And then off you go. It's important to accept the older adults' reality as they move backwards in time and not try to reorient them. And if, they, if they're asking about the location of dead relatives, it's an opportunity to reminisce. Hey, where's mom? And you can honestly answer, I don't know. What do you love most about your mom? And, and, and say it, ask it in the present tense. Because sometimes asking about a dead relative may not be concrete. They may not be wondering where mom is. They may be trying to express feelings of wanting to be safe wanting to be home because home is safe. And oftentimes people living with dementia will tell you, what should I be doing? They, they're afraid they're, they should be doing something and they're not. So you can say to them, you are where you need to be right now. It's, it's good and reassure them that way. Now, some of the holiday pitfalls, good intentions with unattended consequences. Oftentimes, some people living with dementia may have a glass of wine or an adult beverage, and then they forgot they had that adult beverage. So then they have a second one, and then they forgot, and now they have, they think they've had one or two drinks, but they've really had quite a few more. So if that is the situation, you may want to consider diluting the alcohol or swapping the alcohol with something else. For people who enjoy wine, I've learned that fermented tea called kombucha, certain flavors have a little bit of a fizz to it and a little bit of a bite. And I personally like kombucha and I put it in a wine glass and I enjoy drinking the fermented tea. I mean, there might be like a little bit of alcohol in there, like 0.0001%, but you don't need ID to buy it. So it's like buying non-alcoholic wine. But it's a, it's a nice, they have different flavors, and it's just a nice change from water or soda, and it's also lower in calories. So you may want to consider giving them something else, or I've had family members swap non-alcoholic beverages for the alcoholic beverages. If you're going to spend, if you're going to take your family member for an overnight visit, Please be prepared for possible wandering, falls, or incontinence. So you may want to bring some type of portable alarm that you can put on the door. So if they open it up in the middle of the night, you hear them. You may want to be aware of 
possible fall risks. At your house, you picked up all the throw rugs and you made sure there wasn't a lot of clutter. Where you're visiting or if you're staying at a hotel, tell there may be things that can increase the risk for falls. Some people, when they make hotel reservations, do ask for the handicapped accessible rooms because there are more bars along the tub. The shower is a walk-in. You don't step over the, the tub and you have reduced risk of falls. For overnight visits, you may have episodes of incontinence because they're having trouble finding the bathroom. Even you may say we're in a hotel room, the bathroom is right there. Yeah, but if you're disoriented, they may walk out the door and wind up in the hallway instead of opening the door to the bathroom. So other options if you're staying at a hotel is to make sure you can bring a nightlight and stick it in the bathroom so that there's a there's a, some light there. So if the person gets up in the middle of the light, night they'll they'll see an illuminated area and head that way other people just leave the bathroom light on because it doesn't bother them if you are traveling by air most major airports now have family restrooms which are wonderful because when the caregiver and the care recipient are different genders i've had i've heard of lots of horror stories where the gentleman had to go to the bathroom and he really couldn't take his wife with him. So he sat her down while he ran into the bathroom. And even though he was lickety split, when he ran out of the bathroom, she was gone. And other situations where the person with dementia went into the bathroom and then, you know, got confused or couldn't figure out, maybe took off their pants and their underpants, then couldn't figure out which one went on first and they walked out of the restroom all in disarray the family restrooms really are a lifesaver you may want to consider pre-boarding so you can situate the person before you know everybody else comes on board a medical alert bracelet is a good idea i like these care cards and the care you can make these some of your i think m4a might have some i know uh uh alzheimer's of central alabama they sometimes give them out but these cards simply say something along the, the something along the lines of the person I'm with has Alzheimer's. Please be patient. Thank you. Or the person I am with has dementia and may act strangely. Thank you for your kindness. Just something that you can hand to the flight attendant discreetly as you board. So if something happens, they're not that they know that the person has a neurocognitive disorder and the person isn't trying to be difficult. You may also want to have your masks and your sanitizer, snacks. It's, it's easy to bring snacks on board. It's harder to bring water. You have to usually purchase it in the, in the area. But what, it, it's always a good idea to have snacks and other objects that would keep them busy, depending on the stage that the person is at. So again, weigh your options. Is the risk of contracting an illness worth the travel, worth the visits, worth, you know, whatever you're doing? And if the answer is yes, it's a good idea to make sure their vaccination status is up to date. And also, if you're in a place where people have to wear face masks or your family decides to wear face masks, you know, I hate to say this, but sometimes people don't have any common sense. Okay, this face mask is fine. This one, it's a little creepy, but okay. This one and this one is not acceptable. So every family member has a goofball who may think wearing some mask like that is acceptable. No, it's not. So if you have that person in your family, you may wanna have a conversation ahead of time. Gifting ideas. If you know a family caregiver, respite is the gift of time. And I don't mean something general like, oh, let me know when you need help. I mean, you, um, you, you give them a card or something where you say, I can give you the first Tuesday of every month this time. And this way, the caregiver knows that you're going to be there the first Tuesday of every month from noon to four, and that's when they can make their appointments. Gift certificates, especially for cleaning services, home repair, home maintenance, uh, some of these different 
um, food preparation companies like Factor, Silver Cuisine, there's all sorts of, I think it's Blue Plate, there's all of these entities now that you can pay a subscription and get so many meals delivered each week. That may be a beautiful thing because not only does the caregiver not have to go food shopping, they also don't have to worry about cooking. They can take the prepared meals and microwave them. Or if they are, if you do have to cook them, everything's there. Other ideas for the older adult, maybe an MP4 with a favorite music playlist, DVDs of favorite old movies. And I know I'm really uh, aging myself here. At this point, I think most people have smart TVs. So perhaps subscriptions to screening services like the Hallmark Channel. Word search and puzzle books, if that's what the older adult likes. There are older, there are adult coloring books, but be careful. Some of the adult coloring books are so heavily patterned it would overwhelm the older adult. Sometimes you're better off going to places like Dollar General and finding generic coloring books and colored, give them colored pencils, not crowns, and that may be something they enjoy. There's also busy blankets for people in the severe stages, and I knew at one point M4A had some of these busy blankets. I don't know if they have them anymore. Also, everybody goes to the nursing home and sees their loved one during the holidays, but that's like only going to services during the holidays. You really, if you want to have a relationship with your divine creator, you really should be interacting more frequently. So having visits and outings beyond the holidays is another, is another beautiful gift for all year round. Now, I was online, and sometimes if you are creative, you can look at different busy boards and different products that are designed to keep the person living with dementia busy. I've had families design their own based on their family members' occupation or hobbies. And this was $60 on Amazon, and at the time I looked, it was $95 on the Alzheimer's store. So shop around. But the other thing you can do is go to the Alzheimer's store and get ideas and do it yourself. As I said before, the dollar store for coloring books and puzzles. You can also ask relatives and friends to save used gift cards and fake credit cards to make the imaginary wallet, especially when that wallet gets lost repeatedly. When I was caring for my family member, one year for Christmas, I bought her a new wallet. I actually bought like five of them. And we took her driver's license and some other uh, forms of ID and uh, copied it on a color printer, laminated it, and made identical wallets. So if she misplaced wallet number one, I could find, I could take wallet number two and tell her, oh, look, I found it. That worked for a while until um, I went into her room one day and found like three wallets all underneath her pillow. So what about family members in long-term care? Emotions outlive the memory, even though you feel like they don't remember that they were there, that you were there, those positive emotions persist. And it's usually better to bring Christmas to the person living with dementia in the facility than taking them out. But that really depends on the individual. I, I usually hate working the weekend of Mother's Day because all the family members take mom out of the facility and they all take her out to dinner and most restaurants are very crowded. It's by the time the person gets back to the nursing home, there's a lot of behaviors for the next 24 hours. So it's usually better to bring the holidays to the person with dementia in the facility. And it's the quality of the interaction, not the quantity. You can, drive by or I really recommend spacing out visits. So instead of having all, all the siblings and their significant others all show up at once, to have a schedule where you all stop by for maybe 15 or 20 minutes and then the next one does it. If your departure provokes crying or anxiety, there are ways to make your departure make sense in a gentle way. 
and I don't mean to sound uh, crass or anything, but if you have someone with severe memory loss and you say, I'm going to the bathroom and then you leave and you don't come back, I know that sounds awful, but all they, they're gonna forget because of the short-term memory loss. So it's just, instead of you saying, I'm gonna leave now, and you, they react to the words, leave now, and you hear, take me with the, you, I wanna leave. I see this all the time. The person in the nursing home is fine. They're doing their thing. They have their, their little circle of friends. And for the most part, their days are uneventful. But sometimes when families come to visit and then the family says, I'm going to leave now, and they start saying their goodbyes, that's when those goodbyes start to trigger sadness and the person then becomes upset and starts to say things like, take me home, I don't want to be here. And I try to tell the family, you know, 10 minutes before you showed up, every, everything was fine. So instead of saying, okay, dad, I'm going to leave, or hey, mom, I'm going to leave and making a big deal out of it, just say, oh, I have to go to the bathroom and then exit. Or I used to schedule my visits with my family member around mealtime. And what I would do is when the tray arrived, I would say, oh, great, your lunch or your dinner has arrived. I need to go home and fix a meal for the kids. And she would look up and say, okay, honey, and you know, I'll see you tomorrow. And it was no big deal. That worked as well. So the thing with the holidays is we all want perfection. We all want everything. We all, I think a lot of us have this um, insane idea that we're going to have this perfect family holiday and everything's going to go great. Well, this is my house. That's Lady Grey knocking stuff over. Or things go wrong. And I think, I hate to say lower your expectations, but yeah, I think if you have a goal of, of having the best time you can within the context of the disease, and making it memorable and adapt it to your loved one, I think your stress will go down and all will enjoy the upcoming holidays. So I'd like to thank the School of Nursing that keeps me employed and off the streets, my, uh, the Brain Aging and Memory Clinic where I practice, M4A for sponsoring this talk, and for, to caregivers and care partners everywhere. So as far as Facebook Live goes, Rita, it looks like there was some pretty good interest when you were talking about um, kombucha as an alternative to wine and things of that nature. So do you have any other suggestions as far as how to accommodate the tradition of having an adult beverage? Yeah, with you, Christmas dinner. Right. And another thing that I get a lot is for our, our Jewish listeners, you have the Shabbos, the uh, Sabbath dinner, which historically includes wine. What sometimes what happens is if everybody else is drinking, the person living with dementia feels left out. So one option is it's a dry celebration. And another option is and I've seen families do it. I had one family that would go to this restaurant every, say, Saturday with all their friends. And, and a lot of people would consume wine. And what they did is they brought the non-alcoholic wine and showed it to the wait staff and said, that person over there in the blue blazer, she gets the non-alcoholic wine. And so when the waiters were pouring the wine, one person would be pouring the glasses of the participants and another wait person would come up and fill the, the woman's wine glass. I've had family members put non-alcoholic wine in the same bottle that the normal wine would be in. Okay, good ideas on that one. Um, another point of interest from Facebook Live was uh, when discussing family members, do we have any additional suggestions for people who really just aren't getting it? Yes, um, 
it is really difficult for family caregivers because you're caring for the person and now you have to educate the individuals in your family that keep saying there's nothing wrong with dad dad's fine he's just getting old no he's not fine some of the things i've had family members do is the family member who's not getting it i've i've suggested they come to the appointment uh, when i see people and and uh, i mean i've had siblings where one sibling is the caregiver and the other two are not getting it i've had them come to the appointment the other thing i've done is i've had the primary caregiver facetime the appointment and the other siblings can participate so i've i've done that i've had family members ask me if they could record the visit absolutely and what they did is when they had family members who weren't getting it they play the recording of the the visit where i'm asking things like and who's the president of the united states kennedy what year is this 1986. Uh, i'm going to give you three words face velvet church and then i have them draw the face of a clock what were those three words i don't know well one was a building was it a temple church or stable and they go stable so if you see the person struggling with these cognitive assessments i think that may bring the situation home now not all providers are comfortable doing that but it doesn't hurt to ask okay um another question that we have floating out in all of the cyber spaces um what about the delay in processing via neural pathways and if there are activities that your loved one can engage in to help maintain cognitive function and mm -hmm. slow the progression of that decline there's there's several things first of all what's good for the heart is good for the brain a food plan that follows the mediterranean plan i hate to say mediterranean diet because it's really not a diet it's not rest like sh restrictive like you know you can only have well the, the mediterranean diet focuses on getting your calories from fresh fruits and vegetables and getting your fats predominantly from plant sources like olive oil avocados and eating lean sources of protein and limiting red meat and and uh, animal fat that has been shown to not only prevent cardiovascular disease the mediterranean diet has also been shown to support brain health so that's one approach you can do exercises i think the uh, aarp has cognitive exercises online there are i mean things like sudoku volunteering socializing those things also can help uh, maintain a health, uh, can maintain brain health and slow down the decline. I saw that with COVID. I had someone who showed up with mild dementia and he couldn't drive, but his buddies picked him up and they went to the gym five days a week. Now, I don't know how much actual working out he was doing, but he would be there for hours. And what would happen is he'd get dressed in the morning, he'd go to the gym, remove his clothes, put on his workout clothes, do some exercises, go back to the locker room, put his bathing suit on, swim a little bit, go back to the locker room, change out of the bathing suit, shower and put his regular clothes on and then go home. So what was happening was he was performing certain activities multiple times a day. And every time you do something, those neurons fire. And it's when you stop doing something in it, with dementia that you may lose that knowledge of how to do that activity. I saw him for a, a couple of years before COVID and he was pretty stable. I saw him six months after the lockdown and the change was horrible he went from mild 
and able to do his own care, could help around the house, to being unable to dress himself. And that's because he had nowhere to go. And, you know, the family didn't think about it. So he would get up in the morning and he would just stay in his pajamas. The more you have a person living with dementia safely do activities, the more you preserve those abilities to do that activity. Does that make sense? Absolutely. I think that's wonderful information. Uh, one more question regarding caregivers specifically. Um, do you have any tips or tricks for quickly unstressing or de-stressing so that the caregiver can eliminate any bad vibes that they may be giving off? Yes. And this is going to sound so simple, but it's something I use all the time. Deep breathing. I literally take slow breaths to the count of three to five through my nose, exhale three to five to the count of three to five through my mouth. And I do that uh, multiple times until I feel myself getting calm. Because whenever you feel stressed, you will notice you start to hold your breath or you start to breathe shallowly. Breathing is the only bodily function that is both under voluntary and involuntary control. It's connected to the vagal nerve and the vagal nerve can slow down and calm the heart, the breathing. So I, that's, that's a technique I use a lot, especially when you saw the last slide, I ride horses and sometimes going over a jump, I start to tense up and I hear people say, breathe. I literally sometimes sing when I'm riding because if I'm singing, I'm breathing. So the slow, deep breaths in and out can really change your vibes. I actually do it in the clinic in between family members and visits. I'll walk out of one room, I'll walk down the hall, I'll take a couple deep breaths, kind of shake off the energy and go fresh into a new room. Very good. I think the only other thing that's kind of running around in space right now is actually in the space between my ears over here. Um, is there anything that you shouldn't engage in so far as activities with your loved one? I'm thinking of someone that I recently interacted with. Their loved one was an engineer and drew drafting plans for airplanes his entire career and trying to search for an activity for him that didn't feel menial or belittling to his intelligence was kind of hard. So mm. I suggested some of the um, scale models for airplanes and things of that nature. Is there a point where the off-brand items like that are not going to be appropriate or is that only in a situation where it is no longer physically safe for that person to engage? It, it really, I love your creativity with the, the model airplanes because you're right, you wanna give them an outlet but you don't want them to feel like they're a four-year-old and it depends on where they are on the dementia journey because I had families discover, I had a, a, an intergen a family where multiple generations were living under one roof. And there was a three-year-old grandchild who would sit at the kitchen table and play with Legos. And one day grandfather sat down and he started playing with the three-year-old or maybe it was a five-year-old and they were playing with the Legos. And the family members were shocked. He had a good time with the Legos. And as the dementia got worse, then he did the puzzles that were the big like blocks. So I love the idea of modifying pleasurable activities to where the person is. And as long as they're not, you know, in eating the parts or, or doing anything dangerous, let them do that activity. I had a situation where I had someone who loved to mow the lawn and this is Alabama in July and it was a gas mower. 
And he was starting to forget what area should be mowed and what area should not. And also he was filling up the gas tank with the, uh, with the um, lawnmower running, which was a problem. And the family didn't like him handling gasoline. So I suggested, hey, somebody bring him a gift of a new electric mower and take the blades off. Because a lot of these mowers, you, they come in a box, you have to put them together. It, it's easy to pop off a blade. And the electric mowers run on batteries that if you're lucky, maybe you'll get an hour out of that battery. And if there's no blade, it doesn't matter where he is mowing. And that turned out to be an awesome solution because when he was mowing with the gas mower, he would go for hours and hours and walk in the house dehydrated because he wouldn't stop. With the electric mower, it would stop. And then his wife or son would come out and say, okay, dad, we need to recharge the battery. Why don't you come in and have some iced tea while you're waiting? And he would come in and sit in the AC and have a couple glasses of water while the battery was charging. Okay. So, so all all creative ways and a lot of families are highly creative. So in general, as long as it's not a health or a safety risk, get as creative as necessary. Mm -hmm. um, as long as we're not crossing again, any health or safety risks or any um, ethical or legal situation. That, that's, also, <laughs> that's also a good point. I don't want to break the law. Because that when I when I was talking about you know, um, what one of the things my uh, relative was is she always liked to have cash and she would lose it. So I was making copies of um, dollar bills on the printer, and then my son, who was uh, he's now a state trooper in Florida, but he was taking criminology at the time, and he goes, you know, mom, it. He, I don't know if this is true, but he told me it was a federal offense to make copies of money. And I said, oh, wow. Gee. Yeah. I said, Mark, I'm not like taking these copies and spending them at Walmart. You know, I'm putting them in Mary's wallet so she has money. And, and if she loses it, who cares? So, talking about illegal and unethical, um, you know, whoops. But <laughs> I mean, we live and learn, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't see anything else floating around out here. So I definitely thank you for joining us today, Rita. You are a wealth of information. Uh, real quick, a couple of things to help middle Alabama pay some bills over here. Uh, we're going to just very, very quickly run through Middle Alabama Area Agency on Aging or M4A is one of 13 area agencies on aging in Alabama. We, One of these agencies will cover all 67 counties in Alabama. Our overall mission is to age in place within your community because over 90% of adults age 65 and older want to be able to stay at home. Our specific goal at M4A is to empower individuals, people living with disabilities and their caregivers to self-advocate as well as to live independently and safely in the communities of their choice. Our motto is assisting all ages at all stages. Uh, we serve Blunt, Chilton, Shelby, St. Clair, Walker counties. And for our senior employment program, we serve Jefferson County, but this is actually the only program that operates there. If you are interested in any services that M4A has to provide, I'd encourage you to reach out to our Aging and Disability Resource Center. The statewide number is going to be 1-800-AGE-LINE. This is your one-stop shop for anything age-related or long-term care services and support. You can also visit our website at m4a.org and click the button at the top right of the page that says make a referral. You're going to go through and see a little bit of information regarding the person who's needing help, what they're interested in, and then a little bit about you as the person making the referral. Every single area agency on aging across the state is going to offer an elderly nutrition program, 
caregiver support through the Alabama CARES program, medication assistance through Senior RX, insurance counseling through SHIP, a senior employment program, which is a job skill training program for people interested in reentering the workforce. We're going to provide legal assistance. That's going to be a service that connects you to an elder law attorney. And in most cases, it is a free service. Uh, we also have a program for elder abuse prevention and long-term care support. Things that are specific to M4A, the Panda Project, the Dementia Friendly Alabama Initiative, which is where we partner with first responders and law enforcement to make sure that they are trained regarding dementia, because unfortunately, there's so many different types of dementia and each type of dementia looks differently. People in first responder situations may get confused and handle it as though it was a different condition and we might not experience as good outcomes as if they were trained in how to respond to someone living with dementia. We have our Living Well Alabama program, which is a chronic disease self-management training program. We have our Critical Needs Fund, also known as the Campaign Memorial Fund. It if you're not qualified for any of our other programs at M4A, but you're in an emergent situation, the Critical Needs Fund may be able to help, as well as the AIM Community Services Project, which has a limited budget that can help with minor home repairs just to make sure that you can be safe in your home. Follow us on social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, as well as a variety of newsletters that go out. We're most active on Facebook and all of our recorded sessions are presented on YouTube. So here's our contact information and I don't see any questions popping up about M4A. Our next coffee break is uh, tentatively planned for March. So keep an eye on Facebook for us and Thank you all so very much for joining us today. It has been a pleasure, again, being able to learn from you, Rita. I learn something new every single time.